much, Ryan, for that. And welcome to Titan Talks. And Barbara, thank you so much for coming and being our first guest. Um, you I want to tell them how you got me here. I, I'm going to tell that story, but I have a question first. Um, who has read Barbara's book? Different. T who has read it? Any all right, guys, we have some work to do, because if you haven't read this book, you need to order it. It's a great read, even if you're not getting into real estate. Um, there's so many great stories in here, so I encourage you uh, to get this book, Shark Tales, or if you don't have uh, big breasts, put ribbons on your ponytails. It's the same book, but they're great. I love them. But I want to remind, I'm going to surprise Barbara right now. When I started as a manager, my first day, what arrived on my desk was this with a note inside inscription from Barbara. Oh, really? Oh, yes. It says, for Bess, here's wishing you the best of luck managing my wonderful people. Treat each of them like the treasures they are. Love, Barbara. So this is Barbara, right? And that's exactly how Barbara ran her business. When I was there as an agent, and I was expecting, and I had a huge stomach, and pregnant with, with my son, who's almost 20 now, Barbara ran up to me. I was in the lobby, and she put her hands on my stomach and came up to me and asked I'd be me how. I sued for that today. Yes, <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> and so, but that's how Barbara Corcoran operates. She sees people. She takes care of people. Um, she raises the level of everything. So I'm so excited to have you here today. It's really Thank an you honor. And you, if you want to tell that story about how I got her here, we'll talk about that later. Okay. Sorry, we're going to have to get into that later. I want to talk first about. Um, a story in this book, when Barbara was first starting in real estate, um, and she had a little bit of money, and she wanted to buy a new coat, and she marched over to Bergdorf Goodman's, and she says she was the flashiest um, coat on the floor, curly brown with white fur, um, diamond buttons going down, big, um, uh, big uh, shoulder pads, and uh, so she bought this coat. And it was her brand. It was a statement. And everybody knew Barbara with this coat on. And I love that story because you have to invest in yourself, your own brand. And you are a mastermind at that. Uh, no one does it better than you. And I want to know, where did you get that from? Talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, I think, uh, where did I get my ability to brand from? It's a great question. My earliest recollection was I was the entertainer in my neighborhood. We had 10 kids. We all play our games on the block. But all the kids in town wanted to play on my block because I made phenomenal chalk games. <laughs> like circular games, every square you had to do something different. I put different colors with chalk. And uh, I found it was my way to make friends. Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> I've seen more familiar faces. <laughs> um, and I realized if I had a gimmick, I would have friends. Uh, I was rather shy, didn't know how else to do it, but I was very popular. I had a different situation at school, however. I was a dumb kid. I couldn't read. I couldn't write. The kids laughed at me. So I almost had two personalities, you know? Mm. And um, I realized my power tool was uh, dreaming up some kind of gimmick that could entertain people. And I did it for my entire life. I had 22 jobs by the time I turned 23. I know because I counted them once. <laughs> but I realized in every job that I excelled at, not important jobs, menial jobs, um, it was because of my personality and my ability to entertain. And if you think about marketing, uh, it's nothing more than catching someone's attention and holding it and having them look at you versus the next guy. <laughs> and so I've always been able, always able to get attention. Yeah. I should mention one other thing. You know, As one of 10 children, you have a huge advantage in getting attention because you have two parents and you have 10 kids who want their attention. And so I competed for attention with my mother and father. And I didn't often win. We all won. We were all competitive. Uh, but I had early, early grooming on getting attention. And that's what marketing is. I think that was your question, Mark. Yeah, it right? was. I yeah. mean, that's how you, you knew to stand out. You went and you got a coat. You said, I'm going to get the flashiest girl in the room. That's the coat. Yeah. And you knew when you walked down the street, everybody was going to say, that's Barbara because of your coat. So you yeah. had that early on. Yeah. Um, I might also add, not to get you away from your second question, but I might also add, I bought that coat for $340 out of my first $350, $350 commission check. <laughs> so I had that check in my hand. And rather than thinking, what should I do with it, buy another ad in the New York Times or pay the rent next month, I thought, I got the money for a coat. <laughs> and anyone else would think randomly or recklessly spending money like that would be stupid. Uh, I found in that coat 
I was a cat's meow. <laughs> it was so god awful tasteless you know, in hindsight. But I wrapped myself in and I was no longer that kid from New Jersey. I was the fancy lady in New York. And so even that was a marketing trick, sort of, right? And it was yeah. an investment in yourself. Yes, it was. Right? I also want to show off. Yes, yeah. exactly. Why not? Yeah. Um, well, Barbara, the famous story is that you built the group with a $1,000 loan. You mm -hmm. turned it into a $5 billion company. Mm -hmm. um, and so I keep going back to the book because it's, it's got so many beautiful lessons. At the end of the book, when you sell the company, if you look at your bank statement and you see that number and it blows your mind, um, and you say, it all came down to mom. Um, she never said I couldn't. She only told me I could, which yes. was very moving to me and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I want you to talk a little bit about how your upbringing and how that inspired you and how you were able to do so much from parents who really believed in you and trusted you. Well, I think as people, all we really need is one person in our court, firmly in our court, uh, with our back. And you know you're loved top to bottom. Now, I happen to have the good luck of having two parents like that. Think of the richness of having two parents who love me, mm -hmm. right? And with having such a difficult time in school, um, I just really had a hard time thinking well of myself because you define yourself by the school, the classroom, uh, that narrow definition with math and reading, and I was a dunce. Uh, but thank God I had my mother because when I came home from school, she always told me I was a genius. <laughs> I guess she made that shit up, you know? But <laughs> Uh, but I believed her somehow, you know? So, so I could be that, that Barbara versus the other Barbara. Uh, but my mother had uh, unbelievable skills. If I had competed with her, she would have put me out of business. Uh, she, she had an organizational strength uh, that I've never seen in my life, actually. Uh, she had systems for everything. She ran our two-bedroom household with 10 kids, think of that, like a boot camp. Everything had a drawer, everything had a color-coded, everything. She was like an organizational genius, so nothing was out of place. Uh, but my mother's other great strength was with people. Uh, she was not only popular in our town, everyone went to her for advice, but with her children, she believed that each of us had a unique gift. And when she took us home from Holy Name Hospital, she would introduce the child to however many kids were already at home. And she would say, look at your brother T. He's going to be a magnificent dancer. And we went, wow, a dancer. Now, how did she know he was going to grow up and dance for Alvin Alley Dance Theater? Wow. Because she said he had fat legs and he was kicking like hell. <laughs> <laughs> but she labeled each child with a certain gift and then told us about that gift and put us to perform that gift. She said, my gift was my imagination. It was her idea to have me make the chalk games. It was her idea to have me open a rock store. It was her idea with all the wacky stuff. Uh, but in, a, in enabling us to have our own little platforms as one of 10, uh, she built each of us. And the other thing she uh, did was, you know, you, as you get older, you appreciate what your parents did well. You forget about what they didn't do well. I'm sure she did something wrong. Uh, but she was able to um, build our strength and never make us question ourselves. And we went out as our mother's kids. And that was the gift of my mother. Now, in building my business, if I were to name the two greatest things I had, I had organizational strength. You give me a mess, I couldn't make a system out of it in a second. I could see right through it and know what to do. And if you give me a person, I could size them up and down. I could do that to you, to you, to you, just by looking at you. <laughs> and I would know how to choose your strength and build around it easily. And think about building a business. It's all people. It's all what you do with that individual, right? Yeah. And, and that was, I all got from my mother. I don't think there's anything original about me, quite honestly. Well, yeah. there are many original things. So I see you as a pioneer. I know everybody here sees you as that. Do you see yourself as a pioneer? Oh, most definitely. <laughs> I yeah. do. Yeah. I still am in my own respective space. Um, you know, it was easy for me to be a pioneer, if you think about it, because I started in the old boys club. I wasn't welcome. I wasn't acknowledged. I wasn't respected. Mm. And you know what the upside of all that is? You're free to do as you want. <laughs> if I had had privileged parents and expectations and money, uh, a lot of what I would have attempted to do would not have been pioneering. I would have saved money, not want to embarrass anybody. I would have had attorneys or accountants to vet things through, like the big guys had. You know, I was free as a bird. 
And when nobody's watching you and nobody gives a damn what you're doing, you come up and bite them in the ass when they least suspect it. Yeah. And that was my goal. I wanted to be the queen of New York real estate. If people ignored me at a real estate board of New York meeting or didn't give me respect or tried to pack a, a, with each other against me, uh, then I knew I was going somewhere. But until that happened, I was really free to do whatever the heck I wanted. Think of the advantage of that. And today, uh, you know, kids are saddled with expectations, more affluent, more expectations, I think. They're crippled by that because then they can't be free and do and innovate. Not you only that, them. they have to measure up. Yeah. What a pain in the ass to have to measure up. Wow. And what a freedom to do whatever you want. And I had that freedom. So my partner was freedom in all that, or I would have never been able to be the innovator, you see? Yeah, yeah. that's where the pioneering came in, yeah. which is a big piece yes. of our business. I was thankful. Uh, your mom, there's mm -hmm. so many lessons about, you know, that your mom taught you, but, you know, your mom in inspired you so much, but she was not a businesswoman. Mm -hmm. So what do you think it was about her lessons that made you so successful in business? Um, she was practical. Everything she did worked. I witnessed her as a child. Everything worked. And so I just copied her. I just got the right people. I got the right systems. Um, I loved my salespeople as much as my mother loved her children, and I did. Don't touch my agent. I mean, you might recruit them out, although that rarely ever happened. Um, I just knew that my job was to work for my agent. I knew that from day one. It wasn't that the agent worked for me. I never for a moment thought that anybody worked for me. I worked for them. And so what could I do for you lately? How could I make you stronger? How could I wrap myself around you? What can I give you? On and on and on and on. I was there as a servant in every way I could. I think you could do that with any business today, any shrewd, um, shrewd good manager, a good leader, I should say, rather than manager. Any good leader should do that because you get a free ride to the top on the back of your people. They, go, they get stronger and stronger, and all of a sudden, you don't know why you're going up. <laughs> you're going up because all your people are getting stronger, you see? And so um, I think I always had my priorities right. Even my mother did this. She tapped. I'm going to sit on my hand. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's yeah. what you know. the agents that worked with you and people that worked with you still talk about to mm -hmm. this day. There's so many. I mean, Rhea and so many others come up and talk about you and how mm -hmm. you inspire them, how you touch them and left them with something. They felt special. Mm -hmm. And not everybody well, can do special. that. I didn't just pick anybody, you know. No, I, I, and yeah. that's, I think that's what makes it uh, mm -hmm. different. Um, so we have a lot of students in the room. And uh, we have a lot of agents as well. Um, but I think a lot of uh, students ask themselves, what do I want to do as a career? They try to figure that out. And I always say, I say to my kids and to young people, you should work, do what you're good at. Work at what you're good at. Don't do what you love. Because sometimes, unless it's you're good at what you love. Because we have this concept in this country, I think, where it says, you know, pursue whatever you love. But sometimes you're not good at what you love. So find out what you're good at and pursue that. And so I would ask you, what advice would you give to young people who are pursuing a career? What do you think that they should think about? Well, you need the experience of finding out what you're good at. Mm. It's great to sit at a desk and say, I think I'm good at this and this. It doesn't work that way. You have to throw yourself into the circumstance and see what you're good at. Mm. Uh, I like to draw a parallel between uh, working and shopping, as weird as it sounds. <laughs> you would go into a department store and realize you're going to pick out the right outfits for yourself. Everybody tried on all kinds of stuff before you knew what you looked good. And you don't wear this style, you don't wear that style. Uh, so you have to go out into the marketplace and try on a bunch of stuff. I think uh, young people are under a lot of pressure to kind of decide what they were going to be when they grow up, even before they've grown up. Mm. <laughs> I think it's hard. Remember, I had the advantage of 22 jobs. I knew I was good at. I knew exactly what I was good at. I knew exactly what I was bad at. Anything involved writing, I failed. Okay. Anything that I had to add up numbers, I failed. So I stayed away from those jobs. I eliminated those jobs and anything. What's the responsibility? Math? No, thank you. Mm -hmm. Even if it's adding up on a tab, you know? But I found out that I was good at bullshit. <laughs> I was good at selling. I didn't see it as selling. I saw it as romancing the stone, you know? If I was working in a lady shop, uh, you know, selling dresses, uh, I would always say, let me put it on. <laughs> Nobody else was putting it on. I would go 150% on what I was good at. If I had to talk someone into something, 
I would just stay on it till I talked them into it. <laughs> but if I had to write them a letter and tell them why they should do it, I would have failed. And so I had in those jobs a realization that what I was good at was my personality and romancing people, getting my way through my romance. Not through domineering, because I'm not that type, but just, hey, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so Barbara, uh, real estate is, I think, a relationship business, right? Yes, very much so. So it's changed so All much. business is a relationship business, honestly. Yeah, yeah. But, and, and real estate, though, has changed so much in the last 30 years. You used to have to go on index cards to get information. Everything's on the internet and mm -hmm. transparent, and now you have social media and TikTok and all these things. What would you advise to people who are thinking about pursuing a, a career in real estate? What advice would you give them about real estate today, um, and what things should they think about? Well, it would depend entirely on which area of real estate you're going into. So you're really asking what's the common ground between mm -hmm. the many different facets of real estate development, commercial, residential. Um, I would say uh, having passion for your business is number one, an attitude that you're going to find a way to do it. I mean, let me tell you, I worked with the most incapable people and got them capable, <laughs> you know, because of attitude. I only hired attitude. I never hired talent in my life. I would try to size up the attitude on someone, uh, give them a number in my head immediately, one to 10. If they were above an eight, eight and a half, I'd hire them. I didn't care what they knew, what they didn't know. Their attitude was where I wanted, and I figured I could teach them everything else. <laughs> So I think um, we are in a world where you, you want to have information and do the right things. I think um, most of success is about attitude. You know, I just, maybe that sounds trite. No, it's, it's true. I, I mean, I Paul always says that. I'll hi he hires for personality. Yeah. And Hall Wilkie was a hell of a competitor. Yes. I don't still like you, Hall. <laughs> <laughs> But you have beautiful eyes. He does have those blue eyes. <laughs> he does have those blue eyes. He does have those blue eyes. Um, all right, so we know that rejection, we've all been rejected before, is a vital part of the learning process when it comes to learning. Um, and you've been very open about when you first got on to, or we're going to do Shark Tank, that you almost got cut from it, but then you ended up working with the producers and making it happen. How did you do that? How did you get them to reconsider you again? I did what I did very well my whole life, stand back up. Mm. You know, when I was hired for Shark Tank, when they sent me the contract, I signed it without reading it. I sign all contracts without reading it. <laughs> Takes too long to read it. <laughs> <laughs> I sent it right back, one day delivery, and I told all my friends, I'm going to Hollywood. I went back to Bergdorf's and bought a full leather set of luggage. <laughs> I bought new outfits to sign autographs. In my little head, I was already in Hollywood. <laughs> so after doing those embarrassing announcements, I got another call saying, we changed our mind. We hired another woman for the one lone female seat. I couldn't believe it. I, I remember saying to the assistant to Mark Burnett, that can't be. I pictured it. Everything I picture always comes through. Now, that can't be. That can't be. She finally got rid of me. <laughs> and then I sat at the desk feeling sorry for myself. Mm. Because I had really, I was so excited. It was my next big step in the media world. I was a daytime consultant on real estate on the Today Show. And this was my big chance. <laughs> However, <laughs> I brushed myself off in about 30 seconds. That's about what I give myself to feel sorry for myself. <laughs> And then I sat down and wrote an email. Dear Mark, I understand, not exactly, but I'll give you the gist of it. I understand you've asked another girl to dance instead of me, but I'm much more accustomed. And I'm, I appreciate you using me as a fallback. Would you believe they actually have the nerve to say you're our fallback? Mm. I said, but I'm much more accustomed to coming in first. Uh, I consider your rejection a lucky charm. All the best things in my life happened on the heels of rejection. When? Starting with Sister Stella Marie telling me I'd always be stupid, she was wrong. I'd know how to read and write. When Donald Trump said I'd never see a penny of the $4 million commission he owed me, I sued him in federal court and won every dime. When I did that, that's that, that, in that, here, that, guys, that, by the way. You know, I went through the things. I like, <laughs> yeah? And then I said, I'd like you to invite me to compete for the female seat, and I expect to be on that plane on Tuesday. <laughs> and what do you think happened? <laughs> you were on that plane Tuesday. What was key is, and not only that, I won the seat, but 
what is the most important part of that and why I was able to do that, and why my career kept going on, why it wasn't just luck, it wasn't anything like that. It was my usual great ability to stand back up. Because I had grown so accustomed to being rejected from when I was young to when I was even in real estate. If you don't like rejection, what do you do in the real estate business? Uh, and, and so it was natural for me to stand back up. And it was the standing back up that got me the gig, of course. And think about that. I, I have invested in over 130 businesses to date. I've done this for 14 years. I'm like a fairy godmother. Do you know what a great job I have? You get to be rich, ding. You get to be rich, ding. You know, and I've had this very wonderful career. It wasn't until I was on the show three years that my producer said to me, you know, we signed up three times as many sharks as we needed, and then we rejected two thirds of them. I said, wow, what did they do? He said, nothing. <laughs> no one wrote a letter or an email or called as with an objection. They accepted it. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you're in our business, let me tell you, you have to learn how to get over rejection. That's not personal. Uh, the real big difference between the superstars and everybody else, I know I studied these people. It wasn't connections. I thought it was connections. It wasn't how hard they worked. I fired more people that worked the hardest in my life. I felt terrible. They worked so hard, and I fired them because okay, I couldn't do it. But the real difference between the superstars and everyone else is they take less time feeling sorry for themselves. Mm. That's it. I couldn't come up with anything else. So when I started interviewing, that's what I drilled in on, trying to uncover. Can you, can you tell me, can you tell me, you know, to see how good they are re with rejection and not feeling sorry for themselves. It's terrible. I hire people. I choose partners. And what do I base my decision on? The business? No. The production? No. Do they know this? No. All I do is sit there in my seat and I think to myself, how good are they at getting back up? Because when they're good at getting back up, I make money, and when they don't, no, nah, I don't make any money. When they play victim, even on the smallest way, I never make money. Yeah. <laughs> I need someone who doesn't feel sorry for themselves. That's it. Well, resilience, yeah. right? Resilience is a muscle. You yeah. have to use it. Yeah, but a quick resilience. You know, like, ah, the hell with them. <laughs> Move yeah. on. Yeah. But not, a lot of people are unable, as you know, to do that. People it's feel practice, like, though. It's practice. It is practice. It's not a God-given gift. No. It's just practice. Well, yeah. you taught, not to bring this up, I wasn't mm -hmm. going to, but you talk about this when... You had a boyfriend, Ray, and he broke mm -hmm. up with you for, and he left you for your secretary, Tina. Yes. And you say there's a line in here that I underlined that you said, I felt I had no value without Ray. Mm. And I thought, how many people? Silly girl. I thought, <laughs> but you took one day to feel sorry for yourself. One day you didn't go to work, and then you said, I'm back. I'm in. I'm going in. I'm going to work. And you moved on. Yeah. But that's that, that magic at that young age is unusual. Because it, you, you take a minute to mope, you feel bad, you feel sorry for yourself, but you got to snap back, you got to keep going. Yeah, but I was already 30. When Ramon Simone left me, I was 30 years old. By 30, I felt like I was 80. I'd been around the block. You had a lot of jobs. Not in a sexual way. But <laughs> I had been, you know? And so that rejection, but I have to tell you, he gave me a gift that would have lifted anyone up. When we divided the company on that Friday afternoon, which took about an hour flat, you pick one person, I pick one person, you pick one person. We had 14 people, we each left with seven people. I had to move out, he wanted to stay. But on the way out the door, he said, because I shocked him, I don't blame him, actually. He was a lovely man, and, and my boyfriend, of course, for seven years. But on the way out the door, he said to me, you know you'll never succeed without me. Mm. And you want to know? I wanted to bend down and kiss that man's feet, because I felt it in my chest. I thought, I won't use the F word, but I said, I'd rather die than let you see me not succeed. And he gave me an insurance policy that set me up for life. So if I wasn't already good with rejection, that boom, put a steel in my back. You know what I mean? I'm not quite sure I would have gone through the tough times of building a business. You know, we had so many of them, bankruptcy, the stock market, 9-11. We had millions of them. I was always on the verge of bankruptcy because I was always overextended. But I would think of Ray's words and go, I gotta try one more thing. And that one more thing would always work. So thank God that man gave me that insult. There's so much power in an insult. If you could take it, own it, and say, I'll prove you wrong. I love you know? that. I really I love that. There's yeah. actually a quote in here 
This uh, is like a book review. I can't help it. I, I have to say, Barbara, this is such a good book because it has so many, it's just common sense, these lessons. But you say, I find that every big success happens after I think I've exhausted 100% of my options. For me, success only happens when I give another 10%, which is just what it's you were true. saying. Yeah. And so I think that speaks volumes as to who you are. So uh, I don't know if you've read or heard. I've been very vocal about the reality TV shows, um, Million Dollar Listing. I think that they really um, portray what we do as real estate professionals in a bad way. They make the consumer think that it's easy, that we just look cute and have fancy cars and collect a big check when it's really a huge hustle. So I've been very critical of them. And I know you're a reality TV star, a titan of real estate. What is your view on the reality TV shows that portray real estate agents? I don't think it's so important what I think about it. I think what's important is realize you can't change it. I never work on complain about anything I can't change. It's not in my realm to change that. Reality TV is reality TV. It makes real estate look glamorous. It makes it look easy. It's mm. not. Anyone who's in real estate knows it's not easy. It makes superstars out of the reality TV stars. Their business comes at them that they don't deserve because people just want to associate with them. They got lucky, you're not lucky because you're not the guy on the show, you know? Mm. All right, but the fact of the matter is it brings people into real estate. That's the silver lining in this. It's exactly a parallel to Shark Tank. Shark Tank uh, makes it look like starting the business is a big kahuna. If you have the right idea, I can tell you after investing in all those businesses has nothing to do with success. Success has to do with building the business. Can you do it? Not having the idea. It's meaningless, OK? Um, and much like the, the real estate reality TV, uh, it, it's not going to change, but it brings entrepreneurs into my space. It builds entrepreneurs that would have never thought of starting the business because they see this fantasy world of being an entrepreneur. And they say, I'm going to do that. I mean, I have kids all the time saying, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. We never heard that before Shark Tank. So reality TV and real estate is the same way. It's bringing people in. Some people will leave with too much money they don't deserve to start themselves. It makes it look easy. But who cares? You can't change it. It glamorizes it, and you can't change it. So you might as well just laugh about it and maybe try to become a reality TV star. <laughs> Would be a smart move. <laughs> I just, I think my criticism, is, criticism has been because I think it, it, it takes away from how hard it is to be a real estate agent. It's, as you know, seven days a week, you have to have the hustle, muscle, you only get paid for what you act, the results. Yes. And I think it's such a poor portrayal of what we do that it takes professionalism, ethics, all these things. So that's why I've just been critical. I, I think it's great that some people make a lot of money and do that, okay. but I t say to consumers, that is not what it's about, even though they portray that. It's like those housewives on TV. Oh. They don't wake up, you don't wake up with a stylist and your makeup, to, I mean, you got the dog barking, you got the kid with the diaper. I mean, life is messy. And so that's the only thing with reality. It's not really reality, that's I, all. I wholeheartedly agree with you, but uh, think of the angst you feel in having that opinion. You're better off laughing it off. Yeah. And say, isn't it crazy? Yeah, I guess. And moving on. I might have to have a drink for that. I yeah. Don't <laughs> I don't know, Barbara. You're better than me. I get too annoyed with it, but yes. So let me shift gears a little bit. I love there's a story about, um, which you've probably heard, the bird on the tree um, doesn't worry about the branch breaking because the bird's trust is in its own wings, not on mm. the branch, right? Beautiful. And I think that today with young people, um, there's so much chaos and riffraff. And I think we're in this comparison quicksand oh, with so social so. media, right? Mm. And everybody's looking at everything else. And also people are pulling on others for their own happiness, you mm. know, like a boyfriend or material things. And young people do that because they can't help it. It's social media. My question to you is to a lot of these young people and students out there, what would you say to them as to, like the bird on the tree, you know, stay in control of yourself, put power into yourself versus other things? What would you say to inspire them for their futures? What should they think about? How do they not get caught up in the mess of the everyday and the social media? Well, let me share a story with you that uh, might be helpful. First of all, you can't look right and left. You can't. You start comparing yourself to everybody else, mm. you're minding their business, not your own. It's stupid. It's just downright stupid. Okay. But how do you avoid it when so much is in your face, right? I had an interesting life lesson. I guess I was in business seven or eight years. We were probably 
13 in our marketplace in the pecking order, then we were nine, then we were eight. And by the time we were seven, boy, oh boy, I thought, you know what, we're gonna make it. We're gonna make it to the top spot. I'm gonna be the queen like I wanted to be. <laughs> and when I published the Corcoran Report on 11 sales, God forbid why they ever published it on them. You know, the New York Times wrote about it. <laughs> Goes to show you, I'll write about anything. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, once that was done and the reporters were coming to me for a lot of comment, I thought, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna study my competition. I knew what Hall Wilkie's listings were by price, by area of town, <laughs> by who the agent was. I had massive charts. I knew what Douglas Elliman, all the people above me, I charted them out. I did it by the month with Esther Kaplan, who is my partner in the business. Charted out every month. You asked me any question about our competitors, I was like a walking genius. This kid who couldn't even study in school. <laughs> <laughs> that was the only year I didn't pull ahead. I started in 12th position, I ended the year in 12th position. <laughs> Proving that I was so busy watching everything else that I wasn't doing my own knitting. Okay. I threw those damn charts away, or had Esther do it, <laughs> and I stopped watching. I didn't care what anybody was doing. I never cared again for the rest of my life. If someone had told me we were in first position, I would have been surprised, because I had nothing to measure against. If someone told me I was doing poorly, I wouldn't have been surprised either, relative to other people, because I had no idea what people were doing. I had my eyes on my own aisle. Boom, I was coming down like a car on a racetrack. Um, I find with people, with social media, it's so much harder mm. uh, to put blinders on. But I do, uh, I have talked very recently, I'm hoping to God it's a trend, I don't think so, because I think there's a giant wave that can't really change. But I've had uh, a number of young people exclude themselves from social media, say I'm not doing it anymore. That's amazing Incredible. to do it, it's, I don't think I could do it myself, you know, I love TikTok. <laughs> but, um, but I think you have to just care about yourself. I think a comparison with anyone, you notice the people who are better than you, you don't notice the people who are worse than you. And why make yourself feel bad? <laughs> just pretend you're the only one in the world and do what you do. It sounds Pollyanna. Okay. I don't know if that's good advice, but I happen to practice that and believe that for myself. No, I think it's great advice. I think it's hard. I think the younger, the more vulnerable you are, you know, I've teen, I have a teenager. Oh, so tough. It's so hard because you see everybody, what they have, what they look like. And also social media just makes, amplifies everything. Yes, it And does. I think for young people, it's just, it's hard, but I agree. We say, you know, sea biscuit. Just think about what you have to do. Don't look to the side. And I think it's a great piece of advice and mm -hmm. what people have to try to do, although it's not easy. Yeah, sure. I think young people would, would never heed advice like that, but I think if you're not that young person, a teenager, um, I don't see any excuse why you can't ignore what's around you and just do what you do. Yeah. Sounds poly, I, I hate to say it because I, I can hear myself, I sound like I'm naive. No, but you're- I, I don't read the newspapers. I don't watch TV. <laughs> I exclude all that. If I can't do anything about it, I'll vote because I can do something about it. If I can't do anything about it, I don't let it take my time. I think it's good advice. And also focus on building a better you. Take care of yourself. Happier you. Happier you, right? Happiness is so mm -hmm. important. Um, I always say sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. Um, and uh, Barbara, sometimes, heard that. but yeah, it, it's you know, sometimes I wake up and say, please, I don't want to learn anything more today. <laughs> I'm done learning. I, this has been enough. There's so much struggle, right? Yeah. And so sometimes, with in the struggle is where you learn everything. Always, it's 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 just the way that it is. Um, any advice to people who are not so confident the way that you are, the way that you handle things? What advice would you give to people who don't just naturally have that? Um, I don't happen to be a believer that people are born with confidence or they're not, or they get it from their parents or not. I don't think that's the game changer. Uh, myself, I think, uh, especially with young people, I think you don't get confidence by winning. I have so many parents who come up and say, you know, if only he would find his thing. He's such a talented man, isn't he, honey? <laughs> you know, I, I've been in this conversation so often. If only he would find his thing, could you help him find his thing? How does a young person find his thing without going out and trying a lot of stuff right? right? Um, so in my opinion, uh, you find confidence by knowing that no matter what happens, you try the hardest. I know that sounds corny. No, but it's true. But it is true. I have practiced my entire life at trying. You know, sometimes you win. I would call it sometimes you lose. You're kinder than I, okay? 
Uh, but you know what? I have to just know that no matter what, I will out-try anybody. <laughs> like, be a sucker and keep trying, keep trying. And, and knowing that, that's where my confidence comes from. I know no matter what I confront, I'll out-try anybody. And if by knowing I can out-try anybody, I'm going to be much more successful than the next guy. Lose a lot, but I'm, I'm, my scorecard's going to be much better in the end. Yeah, so I think teaching uh, people, uh, or adults, teaching yourself that you must try. You must keep trying and not hoping for a positive result even. I don't, do you know what I do now in my business? I try everything. The stuff I try, I should be put in jail for. <laughs> Honestly, it makes no sense. But I think of my office as a giant research and development company. We're not, we're in the media business. We try meta brokerage. <laughs> God, what a waste. <laughs> I've even studying it, okay? Um, we try, we try phone booths in Central Park giving advice. We try, I mean, I make an ass of myself constantly. And out of all those tries, maybe 12 tries, I'll get maybe two hits. But I have two hits <laughs> because I'm not ashamed to try, 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 try. And that's the way I see myself. I'll try anything. I'll persist and try anything. And I believe that's what builds confidence. I've never been able to get confidence from having a success. In fact, when I've had a success, it makes me feel more insecure. Mm. Weird thing about me. Like, what's my next success? Uh-oh, what am I going to do now? So I'm never satisfied. I'm not that type of person that gets satisfied. Uh, but I get great satisfaction just saying, looking at you, you and you, you're my competitor, and go, I know I could out try you on anything. <laughs> that's where I get my confidence from. And I think that's true of most people, especially young people, the habit of trying. Yeah. Perseverance. Yeah. Right? Not getting well, not up. Even, well, perseverance, I guess the it sounds more daunting. Yeah. <laughs> perseverance means sounds, it seems you gotta you're gonna gotta bring the boar in, kill yeah. him. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's trying. Yeah. yeah. Over and over. Well, um, you know, some of the things that have changed for me as a leader uh, had, when I first started out is I had not a lot of patience and I was more reactive. Mm. Um, and I have learned to take space and think about how I want to respond to things. Mm. And I've improved. I've gotten better over time. She worked on it. Um, wondering how you have changed as a leader throughout your career. How do you think you've evolved and changed and grown? Well, I wish I could parallel you. I think I'm a worse leader, honestly, um, because I'm more impatient. I'm grumpy as I get older. <laughs> I don't know why. My changes are behind me. I shouldn't. I have nothing to be grumpy about. But I'm grumpier as I get older, and I'm less patient with people. And so I've gotten better at hiding it. <laughs> okay, but not changing it necessarily. Uh, so um, that that has made me less a good leader. But how I compensate for that, or I like to tell myself how I compensate, is I'm better at uh, throwing the bowl of wax to somebody and say, "Take it away." really delegating it, and throwing another bowl of wax and bowl of wax until I see what they're made of. Mm -hmm. I overindulge people in challenge, and they grow very fast, whereas it used to be me coaching them. I don't have that patience. You don't have that patience <laughs> yeah. anymore. Yeah. Well, you often say you don't have to get it right. You just have to get it going. I just have a belief that the minute you have an idea, you have to get it going. What happens, sadly, with an educated uh, society is people analyze, analyze. The ability to not analyze was my greatest forte in building my business. It's my greatest forte now. Because while my competitors analyze and check where their accountants, check with their attorneys, and had the committee meetings, I was out on the street with the idea. Boom, boom, boom. I think the, reason, the second you have an idea, you get out on the street, run with it, try it out. Uh, because out of all those things you run out on the street with, you're going to get like 60% of them while everybody else is thinking about it. Thinking about it is the biggest uh, obstacle to entrepreneurship in my field right now. I'm in the entrepreneur space. Um, entrepreneurs who think things through and make a great business plan and spend six months have a better chance of never doing it than the guy who has no business plan and runs out with it. Okay? And why I don't believe at all in business plans, unless you're raising funds and you have to put something fancy on a board and stuff. But if you're a real entrepreneur, I find in my space, you just get out and you try it, and that's your business plan. You get out in the street and see what works, what doesn't work, how you could change it. But if you're at your desk analyzing it to death, 
you never get come up with the answers. You know, it's a bob and weave game. That's what you got to do. Just got to get out yeah. there and do and get it going. Get it Some, going. Get some momentum. Get it going. Thank you for bringing me back to my words. Get it going. Get right? it going. Yeah. Um, Did you say get it going? Get it going. Yeah, get it going. Get it going. Get it going. No, get it going. <laughs> <laughs> um, Barbara, talk to us about how you deal with a bully. How do you handle a bully? I mean, so many times kids have this in school. We know it's it's an epidemic, you know, kids that bully other kids, which is so not nice. But as you get older, too, there's sort of this meanness and not nice behavior that we see. How do you how do you handle how do you deal with a bully? Well, first of all, if someone's bullying, you got something that they uh, have. Uh, They're jealous. Either jealous, or they've paid attention. Um, so I'm complimenting, and I really am. I know. It, I know if someone is mimicking me, stealing my idea, bullying me, they're jealous, they're insecure. And so I move on. I don't give any, any heedance. You know, you have um, been a mentor to me, mm -hmm. and you have for paid. For a brief time. No, for, for a whole time, for all the time, because you paved the way. You were a, a woman, innovator, real estate, came on the scene, worked hard, never gave up tenacious, all those things. You are a role model for me, and you paved the way for Thank me you. and for everybody else that's here today. And we're all grateful for you. And you know, you changed the whole landscape of real estate. And everybody owes you a lot of gratitude for that. So I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you. you are. Thank you.